Bible says in verse 1, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus. There's a lot of Aeuses and Adiuses going on. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Father, we love you. God, we do thank you tonight for your word, and we're blessed, God, to be able to surrender our will to the authority of the scriptures. God, we know that your word is truth. We know, God, that your word is eternal. We know that your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and we pray tonight that you would shine your light through your holy scriptures upon our hearts and that you would draw us unto yourself and lead us, Lord, to our Savior Jesus, your Son. We pray tonight that you'd move in each of our lives and miraculously, God, that you would meet needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, chapter 10, verse 1, I have this sense as we look at the context of chapter 10, you remember what Jesus was talking about. Uh, he had been ministering nonstop. It's almost as if as we were looking at chapter 9, that it was one thing literally after another. And in fact, it certainly was. As there was a paralytic man who was healed as Jesus was in the house, as Jesus up in the area of the Galilee had called Matthew the tax collector, uh, as you remember the disciples of John had come to Jesus and had questioned him and the disciples about why they don't fast, uh, and then the story of the synagogue ruler's daughter who had died, and as Jesus was on his way with the disciples, there was that woman who had the issue of blood who believed that if she could just touch the hem of his garment that she would be made whole. And you remember how that story rolled out. She did that and virtue flowed from Christ. She was healed. Jesus, in a sense, called her out so she could publicly demonstrate her faith. And while all of that was happening, Jairus' daughter died. Jesus went to the house, raised her from the dead. And then as he left the house, there were two blind men that were crying out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. Uh, and as Jesus went uh, on and continued to the house, they followed. And of course, he touched their eyes. They were enabled to see. And then a demon-possessed man who was mute came to Christ. He healed him. And then uh, there were more who had demons and who had sicknesses. And he preached the gospel. And all of this is happening. And it's almost one thing after another. And as Jesus is ministering, he says to his disciples, uh, and Matthew, certainly looking in hindsight, could see this in him. There was compassion. There was mercy. He was moved because as he was looking at these Israelites, uh, they were weary and they were like sheep having no shepherd. They were scattered and his heart was moved with compassion and he turned to his disciples and he said, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers, laborers are few. And it's interesting because at this point, Jesus doesn't say, so what you need to do is you need to start a campaign that deals with serving. You need to pressure the people. You need to lay upon them an obligation. Jesus says none of that as he's raising these men up, ultimately to be the leaders in the church. He says, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And I have the sense that Jesus has a smile on his face when he's saying this, because he knows exactly what's going to happen. They're watching, they're listening, they're considering. He has not only demonstrated compassion, but he's conveyed to them the, the obvious need. And then he plants a seed as he exposes the need. He says to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Man, you guys, you really need to pray. And certainly he knew that in their heart there was a stirring. There was a recognition. They probably were thinking, man, we do need to pray. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here, man. We're only 12. You're only one. 
we need more laborers in this field. And the next thing that we see in chapter 10, verse 1, is that Jesus, there's three things that he does. He calls his disciples, he gives them power, and then he sends them out. And what I think was happening here, Jesus, you know, probably having a smile on his face, knew that when he was encouraging his disciples to recognize the need and then go to God in prayer, what he knew that he, what he knew was that when they were going to do that, that God was going to stir within their hearts a desire to serve. That they would be brought to prayer, they would recognize the need, they would come to the Father and say, Father God, please. There are so many people that need to hear this message. There are so many people that need to be touched and healed and cleansed and restored. I pray, please, that you would raise up laborers, that you would send out people into the fields that are wide unto harvest. And day after day of doing this, what began to happen was God began to stir their hearts. What began to happen was there was a, there was a desire, there was a passion for the ministry that began to be birthed within their lives because they were seeking God in prayer. And you know, this is exactly what happens in our life. You know, oftentimes we'll recognize a need, we'll see in the church that something needs to be done, or there's a group that needs to be ministered to, or there's something that's lacking. Or we're out in the world and we think, man, wouldn't it be amazing if? And God stirs your heart, or a well-intentioned brother or sister comes along and says, you know, you need to pray about that. And as you begin to pray, as you begin to ask God to raise up laborers, what God begins to do is he begins to stir in your heart a passion for that particular ministry and then a calling to step out in faith and to do what he has laid on your heart. You know, oftentimes in the ministry, some people will come to me and they'll say, you know what, we really need to do this and we really need to do that and how come we're not doing this? And I'll say, well, why don't you pray about that? Because maybe God's called you to do that, this, or the other thing. And, uh, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road. You know, that's when the intention is really revealed. But it all begins in prayer. It all begins in prayer. And in your prayer closet, that is when God begins to lay out a calling for your life. God begins to call you out. God begins to call you forth. God begins to reveal to you that uh, there is a specific plan that he has for your life that he wants you to be fulfilling. And then you hear it. And as you walk in obedience, the next thing that he does is he empowers you. This is what happens with his disciples. The Bible says again, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So he says, hey, guys, you've been praying. You've been seeking the face of the Father. You know that the fields are wide unto harvest. There's been birth within you, a desire to serve the kingdom. And so I'm calling you to myself, and now I'm giving you the authority. The, the word there, power, uh, isn't in the Greek dunamis. Not that it doesn't necessarily mean the actual miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. The word is exousia, which means authority. He is saying to them, I'm giving you now the authority to go and to function underneath the power of my name. I'm sending you forth in my name, and this is important for us as well. When God lays upon us a calling for the ministry, we want to make sure that we're being sent out in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The last thing that you want to do, right, like uh, the, the sons of Sceva, as they went forth, and they knew there was power in the name of Jesus Christ, but they'd not really been given authority by Jesus. They went out and they used the name of Jesus uh, attempting to exercise demons, and the demon says, you know, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then, you know, the demons did a little uh, uh, number on those guys, and uh, they fled naked. So listen, I'm just telling you, it's not good. <laughs> Need I say more? It's not good to try to do the work of the ministry in your own power or in your own mind. You want to be functioning under the authority of Jesus Christ, and you can't do that unless you've received a calling from him. You know, this isn't arbitrary. And I know sometimes we, th we say things like, uh, God can't steer a parked car, right? We encourage people to get up, to get out, to serve, and it's a legitimate exhortation. And we use the illustration, hey, just like uh, you can't steer a car if it's in park. The car actually has to be moving. 
And so you need to, when it comes to serving God, you need to step out, just step out, and God will guide you. And that is true. But, you know, there's another side to that as well. We do need to be sensitive to the calling of God on our life. We want to make sure that when we're stepping out to serve, that it's something that the Lord has called us to and that we're functioning under His authority. You know, that it's not arbitrary for us. That it's certainly not fueled by our own intellect, by our own ideas. You know, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Sometimes this is really hard for me. I'm an idea guy, right? I mean, I see so many things that can be done. And I've had to really learn the difference between a good idea and God's idea. You know, there can be lots of good ideas, but just because something is a good idea doesn't necessarily mean that it's coming from God. And so we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in our life. There needs to be a willingness to be empowered to come under the authority of Jesus Christ. He calls the 12 to them. He gives them an idea of what their ministry is going to be like. Uh, Matthew takes a moment, kind of in a parenthetical way, and he names the 12 disciples. You're, you'll notice that they're all presented in couplets, right? Uh, and you can see that they're presented in couplets by the conjunction and uh, Simon and Andrew, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, James and Lebeus, uh and Simon and Judas. Now, if I'm signing the Canaanite, like uh, hindsight, I'd be like, Why'd you hook me up with Judas? Because that's just not cool. You guys think you're ministering with somebody difficult? Could you imagine? Can you imagine ministering with Judas Iscariot? But the implication here with the couplets is that they were sent out two by two, right? They went out into the area of the Galilee under the authority of Jesus Christ, and they went out two by two. Now, this is a motley crew of men. These are guys that you just wouldn't typically gather together and begin uh, a church with. I mean, you have people from very different backgrounds. They're, they're ordinary individuals, right? Jesus didn't go to the rabbinical schools and get the ultra-educated people. Not that education is wrong, and not that people in seminaries or something like that don't have a calling uh, of God. But he doesn't go to the rabbinical schools. He takes average, ordinary people like you, right? And like me, average people. You know, sometimes I think we look at the disciples and we think, oh man, you know, there's a pedestal, they're the spiritual giants, and certainly they were wonderful examples, but in some sense, sometimes we disqualify ourselves because of our ordinariness. And I want to say to you that your ordinariness is not a liability in the kingdom of God, it is an asset. Because God chooses the weak and the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God loves to pick the ordinary. Because it's, it's you and me, you know, who really know that if something good happens, it's not us. I mean, when God moves, we know better than anybody else that it had nothing to do with us, that it was the Lord God. Uh, and you know what? When people, the gift of encouragement is a blessing. But when you respond, when someone's encouraging you for the work of the ministry that's happening through your life, uh, and you respond with the, you know what, praise the Lord, God is good, that is a good thing. I think that honors God. God chooses the ordinary because it's through the lives of ordinary people that God is most glorified. Now, the Bible says in verse 5, these 12, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, so he calls he gives and he sends, all right? And this is precisely the pattern for our own lives. You're going to notice something. Those of you who are students of the Word, you've noticed a nuance here between verse 1 and verse 2. In verse 1, the 12 are called disciples, and in verse 2, they're called what? They're called apostles. Disciple means learner. Disciple means student. Right? It's one who has come alongside of a master or a rabbi and engaged completely in understanding all of the doctrine and um, all of the nuances of that particular master's teaching. An apostle is one who is sent out. Uh, an apostle is one who has not only been discipled, but now is stepping out and is living out what he or she has learned. Uh, I want to encourage you. If you're in the place where you're always learning and never doing, 
If you're in the place where you're always taking in, but you are never exercising, you know, uh, we have an issue with, obedi- with obedience, with obesity. We have bu- an issue with both, all right? But we've got an issue with obesity in our culture, right? There's a lot of taking in. There's a lot of consuming. There's a lot of gorging. There's a lot of feeding the flesh, but there's not a lot of exercise. Uh, and you guys know, I mean, the more you take in and the less you exercise, especially as you get older and your, and your metabolism changes, uh, you stop looking like a pencil and you start to look like a pear, right? It all kind of, it just gathers, you know? I mean, it just kind of gathers around the waist. You say, that used to be my chest and now it just kind of dropped down with gravity. I looked like Arnold at one time, you know? And it's just all kind of uh, fallen down around my waist. But I, you know, I would say the same thing spiritually. I would say that we have an issue um, with, in our Christian culture with spiritual obesity, there's a lot of taking in. There's a lot of consuming, right? There's a lot of sitting and listening. And listen, don't get me wrong. We ought to be doing that. We ought to be students. We ought to be disciples. We ought to be engaging. We should be passionate about the Word of God. We should be hungering for it, right? I mean, we should be eating it up. We should be gorging ourselves on the Word. But if we're not getting out and serving, you know, if we're not like, Peter said, allowing that gift to be stirred up within us, or excuse me, as Paul said to Timothy, what's going to happen is we're going to become fat, lazy sheep. You know what happens to a fat sheep that falls over? Do you realize it can't get up, right? It just lays there, you know, and it's just, it's so fat that it can't even get up. And so the shepherd's got to come along and it's got to, you know, get that fat sheep back up on its feet because it's become so obese. And some of us, you know, we've fallen and we can't get up. And, and you know what we need to do? The reality is this. There's a spiritual obesity that's taken place in our lives because we're not serving God. We're not engaging in the work of the ministry. We're not exercising spiritually. You know, it's good to come and to feed on the Word, but what has God called you to? How are you serving the Lord? You know, do you have a heart for the harvest? Are you looking and you're like, man, we should be doing that and we should be doing this and how come this isn't happening? But you're not praying. You're not engaging with the Lord of the harvest and asking him to raise up laborers who can be sent out. I want to encourage you, pray, seek the face of God and then be willing, be willing to be called and empowered and sent out by the Lord. Now, there's a particular ministry that Jesus has for these 12, and you're going to notice this. And, you know, I, for the sake of interpretation tonight, I want you to understand two things about what's happening with Jesus and his disciples. Uh, Jesus is sending out the 12. They are called and empowered and sent. And there's two things you need to realize. Number one, that there are very specific um, elements to this experience that really was uh, for these 12 and not necessarily always something that we can apply to our lives. There are specific things that Jesus is going to call these 12 to that was specific for them. But then in addition to that, there are general principles here for discipleship and for being sent out that we um, ourselves can apply to our lives. So you have to understand those two things. Otherwise, you may end up misinterpreting the things that Jesus is going to say to his disciples. So he's preparing them. He's educating them. And this is what he says. He says, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus is number one. I'm going to tell you the people group that you're ministering to. You're not going to go south. Remember, they're in Galilee. You're not going to go south to the Samaritans. You're not going to go west to the Gentiles, to Tyre and Sidon. You're not going to go to the Decapolis cities and minister to the Gentiles over there. You're not going up to Damascus, to the north. You are going to minister to Jewish people, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I had a Muslim one time tell me, Uh, He said, you know, Jesus never intended the gospel to go to the Gentiles. And he took this portion of scripture and he said, see, 
Jesus even told his disciples that they weren't supposed to go to the Gentiles, but to the Jews alone. Now, you understand that if you take this verse out of context, you could come to that conclusion, but the reality is this. Jesus had just told his disciples and those who were around um, at the healing of the centurion's servant that God was going to call people outside of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they would come down and sit at the table in the kingdom, and that, in fact, there were those of that lineage that wouldn't even be a part of the kingdom of God. We know that Jesus would minister to a Samaritan woman, ultimately. We know that Jesus ministered to a Syrophoenician woman and uh, exclaimed her great faith. We know that Jesus said to his disciples, tarry in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high, uh, and then you will go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So when you take the message of Christ uh, in context of the whole New Testament, you and I understand that Jesus, his intention for the gospel was not just to the Jews alone, but it was also to the Gentiles. But for these 12 specifically, for these 12 specifically, uh, the priority in their ministry was to the Jews. A and there is a priority. Paul said it himself. He said, for the gospel is the power of God into salvation for those who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. And so the priority is for the Jew first. And Jesus is saying to them, you go to these cities, and ultimately Jesus was going to follow up in their ministry uh, and minister in those cities that they had gone to first. Verse 8 says this, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. So priority number one in their ministry is preaching, sharing the gospel, preaching the kingdom of heaven, and then he says that he was giving them authority and power to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. Now, when the disciples came back after this, they were like, Lord, it was so cool. I wish we would have got that on film. There were people who were healed. There were demons who were, who were exercised. There were lepers who were touched. And Jesus says, don't be excited about all of those things. Be excited that your name is written in the book of life. But there was an amazing work of God through the lives of these disciples. Uh, preaching came first, the message of the gospel, and there was an affirmation that that message was from God through signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, remember with me, and we've mentioned this a number of times over the last number of weeks, we believe that all of the gifts in the Bible are for today. Every single one. There are those who believe they're called cessationists. They believe that particular sign gifts um, are no longer necessary because uh, the scripture has been canonized from Genesis to Revelation. And so the real sign is the Bible in its entirety. Uh, but we believe and we experience all of the gifts of the Bible, which means that not only is the gift of prophecy for today, but a, the word of wisdom is for, for today. Not only is the gift of tongues for today, but interpretation of the gift of tongues is for today. Not only is mercy and administration for today and callings, prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers, uh, but we know that God gives gifts of healings. There is no gift of healing. Uh, the Bible says in Corinthians, gifts of healing. So God, as he desires, will give gifts of healings uh, through those disciples that he has sovereignly chosen in a wonderful, miraculous way. Man, we just had an amazing healing happen a, a couple of weeks ago. A brother was in uh, the hospital for six weeks. It was rugged. It was uh, overwhelming for the family. He had severe pancreatitis. He had necrosis of the pancreas. Uh, over 70% of his pancreas had died. And he was being released, which was a miracle. The doctor came in and she looked at the family, and she said, he is a walking miracle. She had tears in her eyes. She's not a believer. She said, there is no other explanation. She said, he should be dead right now. And on the release paper, she put miraculous healing. I think that is so cool, you know. 
And these things happen. I want to encourage you, you know, pray, seek the face of God, you know, be willing to walk in faith and let the Lord do what he desires to do. Never be in a place that you have not because you ask not. I'd rather trust the Lord and believe for great things. He says, freely you have received, freely give, right? So in other words, uh, when you're doing your ministry, uh, don't put on the tagline, and if you send in $10 or $15, or if you give a gift of $50, we will send you an anointed hanky in the mail. (laughs) And if you put this anointed hanky under your pillow every single night, God will bless you. You know, or take the, the, the silver coin that we send you in the mail with your gift of $100, place it in your wallet, and God will, it, it will be your seed gift to God, and God will multiply your cash in your wallet, you know, and we laugh because it sounds so ridiculous, but the reality is there are charlatans out there that are making money off of the message of the gospel, and this is not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, hey, squeeze the people for all they got. He didn't say, take as much as you can. He didn't say, you know, fleece the flock, right? He said, freely you have received, freely give. Ministries are designed by God to give, not to take. You know, the message of this ministry is not what you can give us, it's what we can give you. We want to bless you as God has blessed us. We want to give. We want the blessings of God to flow. We never want someone to feel compelled or obligated or forced into a position of giving, and yet we see so much of that today. And you know, honestly, it's a black eye on the church. I go over to Israel and and, uh, you know, I remember a number of years ago that I was following about a, a week after this particular televangelist. I'm not going to name him. He's got really nice hair, though. <laughs> and he wears really nice suits. And, you know, talking with our Jewish guide, uh, it was so obvious to her that the man was a charlatan and that he was squeezing as much out of the people as he possibly could. And I think, God, please, what a, what a black eye for the name of Christianity. And it's certainly not what Jesus said. Jesus said to his disciples, man, you have received freely, so you should give freely. He says, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staves, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now, this is where it's important for us to remember this was kind of specific instruction for these twelves in this particular situation. Jesus is not saying to pastors for all time or ministers for all time that when they're sent out uh, that they shouldn't have resources or that they shouldn't have an extra set of clothes or an extra set of shoes or uh, a walking stick to help, help them, right? That is certainly not what he's saying. He is teaching his disciples to trust in God. I mean, this is an experience that he is giving them to trust in God for provision. In this particular situation, he is teaching them, you know, the age-old principle that's kind of been reiterated in Calvary chapels like this, where God guides, God provides. You know, if you have a calling and you have an empowering and you are being sent The reality is this, that God is going to provide for you every single step of the way. And most likely, it's going to be in ways that you could have never imagined or ever hoped. You know, typically what we like before we go out, before we're sent, is to have all of our finances lined out and enough in the bank for five years, solid financial backing. Uh, But oftentimes what the Lord does do is he teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now, I've shared with you guys some of the sweetest times for us as a family uh, was during the times that we were most destitute, and we were relying on God every single day. Like, it would be, here we would have a day, and there would be no resources, and I'd go out to the mailbox uh, early in the morning. I'd open it up, and there would be a check from somebody here in the congregation when we were planting a church in New Hampshire, 
And it was a miracle of God. What an amazing thing to experience the miracles of God. And sometimes what God will do is he will pull finances or resources away so that we're not leaning on those things and trusting in those things, but so that we're trusting in him and looking to him and hoping and expecting that he will be our provider. This was precisely the lesson that the disciples were learning. He says in verse 11, now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to it. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. So Jesus says, listen, as you go from city to city or from town to town, uh, those people, what does it mean to be worthy? Those people who receive you, those people who receive your message, uh, those are people who are worthy. Stay in that household, and as you bring that blessing of peace, remember uh, in this particular culture when they would greet each other, they would say, the Lord be with you, uh, and they would respond by saying, the Lord bless you. This was how it was when Boaz was uh, greeting his employees. He said to them, the Lord uh, be with you, and they said, the Lord bless you. So you would enter into a household, uh, and he's saying, if they're receptive to you, if they're receptive to the message, then that, let the blessing from you flow onto them. And if not, if they're not receptive to you, if they're not receptive to the message, then withhold that blessing. In fact, uh, shake off the very dust from your feet. So he says, go and be a witness, go and declare, go and communicate the message. And if there's an unwillingness to receive it, listen, the responsibility for that lies on those who are rejecting the gospel, not on you any longer. You've, you've done your part, right? You've communicated the message, and now it's their responsibility to receive it. You know, we live in a culture that is totally unwilling to take responsibility for anything. Have you noticed that? Uh, it was a really sad situation last week when that Kansas City Chiefs uh, linebacker killed himself and killed his girlfriend. Uh, and it's tragic. You know, it's tragic. And it's interesting to watch. I've mentioned this before. It's interesting to watch our culture try to explain those things and how all of a sudden, all of the psychiatrists, all the psychotherapists, you know, all of the pundits come out and they have their reasons for why our culture is as whacked as our culture is. And what's so interesting is inevitably what happens is they excuse the person for the behavior and they blame it on absolutely everything else. All right, and this is not tonight, this is not like political, I'm not necessarily you know, advocating one thing or another, but it's interesting to listen to people say, well, you know what, uh, it was the gun, or it was uh, the brain damage, it's, it's the gun's fault, or it's football's fault, or it's the society's fault. Well, how about it was his fault? How about it was his responsibility? How about the culpability for that action for killing somebody else lies squarely on his shoulders. We live in a culture, this is the truth, we live in a culture that provides so many excuses for immoral behavior. No one is responsible for anything anymore. No one's, it's, some, it's always somebody else's fault. It's my husband's fault, or it's my wife's fault, or the doctor dropped me on my head when I was born. It's the <laughs> doctor's fault. He was spanking me, and I slipped out of his hand, and, you know, I can trace it all the way back. And you can sit down, and you can go through psychotherapy, and you know what? They'll create memories for you that never even really happened, <laughs> right? So you're like, man, I had no idea that happened. That's crazy. And it never did happen, right? But they just want you to have good self-esteem, and it's really not your fault, and it's everybody else's fault. That's not what the Bible teaches, you know, David had to come to a place where he said to God, against you and you alone have I sinned. There is no freedom. There is no liberty. There is no uh, healing in our life. There is no restitution in relationship issues until we take responsibility for our own actions. There is no forgiveness of sins. You know, you can come in tonight and you can play the Christian game. 
And you can try to justify yourself by having your good works outweigh your bad works, which, by the way, will never happen, right, if you're honest with yourself. And you can try to get a pass on that, but that will never forgive you of your sins. The only way to be forgiven of your sins is to confess your sin before God and repent of it and to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. God will honor us when we take responsibility for our actions. So the story goes on, and Jesus says in verse 15, Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. I think they're probably like, what? What is that about? Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. So this is where it gets a little rugged. I think the disciples were like, okay, man, I'm down for this. This is going to work. And then Jesus says, uh, by the way, you're going to get all torn up. It's going to be rugged. Uh, everyone around you is going to be like a wolf, and you are going to be like a sheep. And by the way, when wolves are snarling and tearing at you, you do not have the freedom to behave like a wolf back. He says, I want you to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Uh, listen, being a Christian isn't always the easiest thing. If someone told you how difficult it would be before you put your trust and faith in Christ, you might have thought, hmm, maybe I need to think this through. It's challenging. And oftentimes, the temptation for us when we're out in the world and the world is resisting and the world is mocking and berating and we're in a place where we're experiencing persecution, when we're even sometimes in the church, and you know, the church is not a perfect place. Sometimes it gets rugged in the church. And there are times where, you know, someone might be treating us in a way that is not biblical. And, you know, that doesn't feel good for us. And sometimes we think we're justified to respond in like manner. Someone's going to behave like a wolf to me, I'm going to behave like a wolf back. Someone's going to berate me, I'm going to berate back. Someone's going to rip me, I'm going to rip them back right? Anybody else? You never feel that way before? Jesus says you don't have the freedom to do it. Peter says it like this, do not return a reviling with a reviling. Peter says, in, or Jesus says, in fact, what we need to be is, number one, as wise as serpents. Now, uh, sometimes I think when we look at this particular metaphor, when we think of a serpent, you know, we connect that with not something that's so positive. But Jesus is saying, be wise, be discerning. Uh, you know, a serpent may not be the brightest critter, but what other critter do you know that can survive in the desert without any arms or legs, you know? I think that's a pretty, pretty wise animal, pretty discerning, having a capability of surviving. Jesus says, be as wise as a serpent, but be as harmless as a dove. And the picture of a dove is uh, obviously one of peace, right? Symbolically in the scripture, the dove always represents peace. And Jesus says, you need to be discerning. You need to understand the angle that people may be taking. You need to be able to see beyond the surface to the real root issue. But even as you see that, you need to make sure that you're walking in the Spirit, that you're a son or a daughter of peace, right? That you're bringing peace, the peace of God, to bear in a situation. Because the reality is this. He says to his disciples, you're going to be delivered up to councils, to synagogues, you're going to be scourged. Verse 18, you'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So probably in their heart and mind, you know, they may be a little uneasy at this time thinking about what Jesus is saying. But Jesus says, listen, don't worry. Trust in God. And in that moment, when you're being delivered up for persecution, you don't have to prepare your speech. You don't have to prearrange what you're going to say. You need to trust in the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is going to be the one who is specifically speaking through you. I want to 
encourage you as well this evening. You know, I, lot, I know a lot of times when we're dealing with non-believers, uh, there is a sense of inadequacy that we have. We think, man, we've got to have every answer lined up, and we've got to know our apologetics, you know, and we've got to prearrange our arguments so, you know, it's solid and, uh, you know, can't be refuted. And while I say those things are not necessarily bad to do, they are bad to do if it's, as, if it's at the expense of trusting in the Holy Spirit to give us His words in that moment. You know, it may be that in the current situation that you're in as you're ministering to non-believers, it may be that God wants to give you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. Like when Jesus was before the Samaritan woman, He says to her, you've had five husbands and the one that you're living with right now is not your husband. You know, we don't ever want to be in a place where we're not trusting God in a dialogue with a non-believer because God may want to bring to us a word of knowledge that pierces right through all of the nonsense, all of the academic arguments, you know, all of the surface things that's really justifying in a person's mind why they are unwilling to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're in that situation, maybe tomorrow or throughout this week, pray to God. Say to him, God, give me a word of knowledge. God, give me a word for this person that's going to pierce through the veil of deception and cause the light of the glory of the gospel to shine in their hearts. And God will be faithful to bring it to you. Verse 21, now brother will deliver up brother to death and a father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You guys have that promise on your screensaver? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, something that y- you want to write somewhere just to remind yourself uh, what Jesus was saying to his disciples. We have such a desire to be loved and to be respected and to be received, and yet Jesus is saying the reality is this. The gospel is a sword. It draws a line in the sand. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 23. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, You will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, Jesus is not talking about his second coming. Jesus is saying to them, listen, you're going to go minister in these cities, and before you're even done, I'm going to be coming behind you, uh, and I'm going to be confirming and affirming the ministry of the Spirit of God through your life. Verse 24, disciples not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there's nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. So Jesus is giving the promise of persecution. We talked about that all the way back in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Jesus is saying, if they persecuted the master, if they called the master the Lord of the flies, or the ruler of the demons, or the Lord of the dunghill, these are all different interpretations for the word Beelzebub. If they did that to the master, what do you think they're going to do to you? You know, if they mocked and they derided Jesus, uh, and they had him nailed to the cross, and he was rejected, You know, he was numbered with the transgressors, but he himself was rejected by his own. Do you, do I really think that we're going to escape rejection from the society around us? You know, do we think that we're going to be able to shine as lights in a dark world and not have some opposition? You know, the reality is this, you know, in our Christian culture, I think we have grown a little soft. We've grown a little soft. Uh, We don't like the resistance. We don't like the rejection. And so we soften the message. You know, we'll we'll talk about God. You can hang out at the water cooler. You can talk about God. But man, when you mention the name of Jesus, what happens? When you drop the J-bomb, when when you say Jesus, right? I mean, you can be talking about God and everyone's gathered around and, and, you know, People are saying, yeah, well, God this and God that, and I'm praying, and and you say, you know what? I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to encourage you. This is your homework for the week. (laughs) You you go and you pray, and you just ask the Lord to show you the right timing to drop a J-bomb, right? I mean, it is, 
It's like a smart bomb. And just sit back and watch what happens. That's all I'm saying. Just, just watch how people respond. You can feel it. It's like electricity because there's power in his name because his name divides, right? Because his name separates because you are either for him or you are against him. Jesus is a the most amazing historical cultural figure, but he is also simultaneously the most polarizing. And it's amazing, you know, in a scenario like that to mention the name of Jesus Christ. And when you mention his name and you live for Jesus, now I'm not talking about living foolishly or being provocative in a way that's really the flesh and not the spirit. Um, I'm talking about being a light for the Lord and living according to the word of God. But you know when you are doing that and you are carrying the banner of the name of Jesus over your life, you know how persecution comes. You know, you can be doing your job, you can be excelling, you can be the smartest, brightest, most productive employee, and you can get passed by because you're not willing to play the game, because you're not willing to lie or to fudge, you know, or to compromise. And I want to tell you, if you're in that situation tonight and you're being bypassed. Other people are, you know, progressing faster up the ladder of success than you. I want to tell you tonight, you are losing nothing and gaining everything. It's okay. It's all right. You're in a good place. You be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, and one day he is going to reward you in a way that is far better, exceeds any raise, exceeds any new opportunity, It will pale in comparison because you're going to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus says, don't fear. Don't fear. Sometimes I think that when we're sharing with the lost, you know, there's that sense that we have to defend God. Uh, God does not need you to defend him. God has been successfully defending himself for all of eternity. I love the story of Voltaire. You remember uh, Voltaire had... He was a French philosopher, atheistic, as anti-God as you could possibly get, not encouraging you to read his writings, but um, he was a man who hated God with his whole heart. And he said this, he said, you know, in 50 years, the Bible is going to be obsolete. The Bible is going to be irrelevant. No one's going to be reading the Bible anymore. And in 50 years, his house was converted into a printing press, one of the first ones from which the Bible was distributed all over the world. Don't you love that? Uh, so I'm just saying, listen, you don't need to defend God. You don't have to ever be in a place where you're, where you're fearful of someone's argument against God. Like, they're going to come up with such a brilliant argument that it's going to wipe out the existence or the reality of God. No, that's never going to happen. God is. God doesn't need you to defend him. God is capable of defending himself. And so you need to walk in boldness. You need to walk in confidence. Do not fear. Verse 27. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Jesus says, I've been discipling, I've been instructing, I've been teaching, we've had our times, now you go and speak the truth and declare it. Verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So he's saying, fear God, don't fear man, fear the Lord. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? Now Jesus says, listen, God knows your situation and circumstance, and God cares. Four uh, sparrows at this time were sold for the equivalent of one single penny. And Jesus is saying, God is so intimately concerned with the details of your life that nothing is trivial. Not even a sparrow, which is seemingly worthless in the scope of things, falls to the ground apart from the will of God. He says, verse 30, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So, the average person has 100 to 150,000 hairs on their head. And you're wondering why I would know that. See, the reality here is God knows every single hair, and some of us have really made it easy on the Lord, right? I mean, (laughs) God can look at me and say, I don't even need to count, man, because it's getting easier and easier as the days go by, Derek, fewer and fewer. But man, he knows every single intimate detail about your life. 
Listen, there's nothing about you that God doesn't know. God knows you better than you know you. You think you know you? God knows you. And there's nothing about you that's trivial to God. The Bible says that he catches every one of our tears in a bottle. He's acquainted with every sorrow and with all of the grief and all of the expectation. He is acquainted with every experience, right? He knows every strength. He knows every weakness. When we were yet in the midst of our mother's womb in the matrix, he was the one forming us, knitting us together. This is how intimately God is acquainted with you. You know, in a very general corporate sense, yes, he's made all of us, but he has handmade you physically, emotionally, with respect to your personality and spiritually as well. And if God knows all this about you, can you trust him? Can you trust the Lord? Can you be at peace and at rest tonight knowing that God knows every single circumstance in your life? And as you faithfully walk in obedience that his perfect will is being done, can you rest in that? Okay, I hope you can. He says, do not fear. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him all, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus says, now listen, this is not necessarily situational. This is positional. Jesus is talking about being positioned in a way where we are confessing him as the Lord of our life. Not necessarily situational, right? There are times where certainly all of us have struggled and maybe not, as, not being as vocal of a witness for Christ as we should have been. Remember, this was the case with Peter. By the way, when the disciples are enumerated, all 12 of them, Peter is always mentioned first because he did have a preeminent role among the 12 disciples. But remember also that he denied even knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet he experienced forgiveness. Jesus is not necessarily talking situational. He's talking positional, being in a place where we have positioned us, ourselves, as having confessed the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of my life, and I'm willing to declare it publicly. I'm willing to let everybody know. Jesus says, when you position yourself for me, I am going to confess you before my Father. So on that day, he is going to declare your name. In the great multitude of people, he is going to say, Sarah, come forth. He's going to say, John, come forth. He's going to say, Keith, come forth. And he's going to confess you before your heavenly father. Isn't that going to be? Have you ever been called out in class before? You ever been called out in public before? You know how the feeling goes when you're brought forward in front of a congregation like this? I had a, um, our school of ministry graduates come forward and they were like, pastor, why'd you do that? I was so nervous. I'm like, it ain't nothing, baby. Just wait until that day. Just wait until you are standing before an innumerable host of people every tribe, every tongue, every ethnicity, and then angels more than can be numbered. And God says, you, come on forward. And, and confesses you, identifies you, perfect. Where the Son says, perfect, cleansed, washed, redeemed, whole, accepted. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Man, what a glorious day that's going to be. The flip side is this. There are those who will be called forth that he will deny, who've not positioned themselves as being believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And on that day, he's going to call them forth, and there will be some who say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many works in your name? And he's going to say to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. How are you positioned tonight as a child of God? The Bible says in verse 34, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his daughter, or excuse me, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. So we do sing this time of year, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Jesus brought peace in this sense that those who become part of the kingdom of God experience peace with God and the peace of God. 
But the message of Christ, remember, Jesus did not bring his kingdom in a worldly sense. The mess- he will do that at his second coming. The message of Christ brings a sword. We've talked about that already. And it will divide even the most intimate and close relationships. He talks about even within a family. Now, remember, this is a Jewish context. I know people that we've been ministering to for years, people who are Jewish, that we've been talking uh, uh, to about the Lord. Uh, They've seen God do wonderful things, and yet they've not chosen to believe because of the pressure in their family. Because they realize that if they choose to confess the name of Jesus Christ, it means that they will lose their family. It means that they'll be... um, you know, they'll be outcasts. They, they, they'll be rejected by their family. And Jesus says, listen, this is the reality of the gospel. This is the reality of the message. It draws a line in the sand. And your love for me needs to be supreme over every other relationship. He says in verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So listen really briefly. He says, your love for me has to be supreme over every other relationship. You know, there may be someone here tonight, maybe listening online, where you've been in this situation where you recognize that you need God. God's been speaking to you. God's been doing a work in your life. And you're at that place, the precipice of faith. You know you need to take a step of faith and put your trust in Jesus Christ. And yet there's a battle raging within you because you're not sure how your boyfriend's going to respond or how your girlfriend's going to respond or how your spouse is going to respond or how your mother or your father is going to respond. And Jesus says to you tonight that love for him has to be supreme over every other relationship. You need to love the Lord so much that you're willing to set all of those other obstacles aside and put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. He says, in addition to that, you'll notice that love for him has to be supreme over every other desire in life. You know, when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you have stopped seeking and pursuing your own desires, your own agenda, you know, your own plan for your life. And you have begun to pursue his plan and his purposes and his desires. And Jesus says something that's counterintuitive. He says, he who finds his life will lose it. Man, if you're looking to find satisfaction and fulfillment and purpose in the things of this world, you will ultimately lose your life. This is what Jesus is saying. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? and yet lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He says, on the other hand, this is what's counterintuitive. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. When you come to that place where you say, Lord, I'm not living for myself. I'm not seeking to fulfill my own desires. I'm going to live for you. That's when you find purpose. That's when you find meaning and satisfaction in life. He says, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. The final thing is this. Jesus says uh, that not only is the prophet rewarded, You know, sometimes we look at people that are being used in ministry. They have a very vocal, outspoken, visible position. We think, man, that person is going to be so rewarded. Billy Graham, so rewarded. But Jesus says it's not just the person who's giving. It's also the person who's receiving. You know, I look at it like this. Tom Brady and Wes Welker, right? I mean, you got a dynamic duo. Do you not? I mean, it's inarguable. You got a dynamic duo. But listen, they work in tandem together. If Tom threw all those amazing passes and Wes was never there to catch all those amazing passes, I mean, would they have as many Super Bowls to celebrate? Would they be in the Hall of Fame? 
No, it took both of them. It took Tom giving. It took Wes receiving. And because you have the connection of the two, they both will receive, in a sense, what? They will both, in a sense, receive a reward. Now, listen, this is how we apply this tonight to our lives. The pastor gives, and you guys receive. And listen, there's a blessing when the message is given, but there's a blessing when the message is received. You know, when you sit and you receive and you take in and you go and apply, there is the same blessing for you that is given to the person who is giving the message. And I think that is so glorious, right? Because the ground at the foot of the cross is level. And one day we're going to stand before God, before the Bema seat of Jesus Christ, and he is going to distribute rewards to his glory. And I'm looking forward to that day. Father, we love you. We thank you tonight for your word. God, we pray tonight that we would be doers of your word and not hearers alone. We pray, God, as this portion of Scripture is challenging, that we would be lights in this dark world. And, God, that we'd not be overcome by darkness, but that the light would overcome the darkness. I pray, God, please, that you would pour out callings. I pray you'd pour out empowerings. I pray that you'd pour out and that you'd send forth your people into the fields that are truly white unto harvest, and that, God, there not be a spiritual obesity within our lives, but, God, we would be the ones to say and to declare, here I am, Lord, send me. Tonight, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, how are you positioned tonight? Have you confessed the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you declared him openly, publicly, that he is your Lord, the Lord of your life? That tonight you've believed in his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Tonight, maybe you're in that place where there have been things holding you up, hanging you up, setting you back. Tonight, you need to let go of those things and you need to come forward in faith as Jesus tonight is calling you. Do you need the forgiveness of sins tonight? You need to be washed and cleansed, to be made a child of God, to know tonight as you leave this place that you have the assurance of everlasting life. Tonight, if this is you and you'd say, Pastor, this is me, I know God has been ministering to me, and tonight I want to make that confession. Tonight I want to step forward. Tonight I want to believe. I want to pray for you tonight, if this is you, that God would give you the courage and the strength to take this step of faith. And I'm going to ask you this evening, if this is you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand tonight? You stretch that hand up high tonight, if this is you. God's speaking to your life. God bless you, and God bless you here in the center. Anybody else, you stretch that hand up high tonight. God bless you here as well. Thank you for raising your hand. God loves you guys. It's a new beginning for you tonight. Anybody else, you stretch that hand up high. I want to pray for you this evening. Whatever it is that's been holding you back, whatever it is that has been hanging you up tonight, you need to let it go. You need to come tonight. Anybody else? God bless you over here on my right. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Stop putting this off. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Father, we love you so much. Tonight we bless your name and we thank you for these precious hearts. God, we ask tonight that you'd give them the courage and strength to make that confession to believe tonight, to come forward in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, if you raise your hand, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer tonight. This prayer begins your relationship with God. It's a prayer of repentance. To repent means to turn away from something. You'll be turning away from a life of sin. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Tonight in this prayer, you'll be putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, confessing that he died on the cross for you and that he rose again on the third day. And tonight through this prayer, as you pray in faith, you'll be receiving the promises of God. Jesus clearly in this portion of scripture has declared to his disciples a public calling. He says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me, so also will I deny you. Tonight, if you raise your hand, 
and you're ready to take this step of faith, even if you did not raise your hand, but you know God is speaking to your heart tonight. Tonight, I want to lead you in this prayer, and I'm going to ask you right now, if you just stand up and come forward to the front, I want to lead you tonight in prayer. God bless you. If you guys just make your stand tonight, come forward this evening. God bless you. Thank you. We're going to wait for you tonight. I know there's more of you out there this evening. You have nothing to fear tonight. You come forward and you make that confession of faith. Anybody else? God bless you. Right on. You know, maybe you're sitting in the middle of an aisle and you uh, don't want to disturb the people around you. Uh, don't worry about that. I know there's some more of you out there. You need to come forward tonight to give you that opportunity. You don't want to leave tonight with regrets. You don't want to walk out of this place regretting the fact that you did not respond to the call of God in your life. God bless you guys. Praise God. Thank you. All right, anybody else? One more moment. I'm going to lead you guys in prayer tonight. This prayer is to God through his son Jesus Christ. It's not to me. It's not to this church. God has promised to hear this prayer. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so I want to encourage you tonight to pray boldly, to pray confidently, because God's going to answer this prayer miraculously. Follow me in prayer tonight. Repeat after me. Dear God, God, tonight I confess I've sinned against you. But tonight I'm turning, turning away from sin, turning from unbelief, turning to Jesus, your son. I believe he died for me, that he rose on the third day, and that through faith in him, you've forgiven me, you've cleansed me, you've made me your child. God, I give you my whole life. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God, guys. Welcome to the family of God.